Hey, what's up? Thank you so much for joining us for our online version of week six in our summer mixtape series. Today we're calling it Born to Run, and I'm curious about, with you and movies, when you decide you're gonna watch a movie, do you typically like to watch movies that you've never seen before? Like you just hate watching ones you've already seen because you already know what's gonna happen? Or are you maybe somebody who like really only enjoys movies you've seen and you wanna see them again and again? Um, for me, something I enjoy when I do end up watching a, a story, a movie that I've seen before, I uh, almost always end up picking up on new things, especially once I've seen it and I know the end and I'm like, oh, I pick up on things um, that I hadn't picked up on the first time. And so today we're going to be in the, uh, the minor prophet that is the easily most well-known and most popular out of all the 12 minor prophets by a long stretch. Jonah is absolutely a name that a lot of people would know, even if they don't know much about the Bible or anything about the uh, minor prophets, but I'm hoping that today that you and I, we may pick up on new things or at least things that God will speak a fresh word to us today from it. So we're going to jump right in and go into it. Jonah 1, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. All right, there's a lot going on here, but first thing, 2 Kings 14.25 shows us that this Jonah is a prophet. He's a, a servant of the Lord. He's a prophet, and uh, prophets are given you know, words by God to share with people, and that's what Jonah is, a prophet who's given words by God to share with people. Like Zechariah, what we talked about last week, he was given the word, tell the Israelites they need to care for the disadvantaged. Like God told Obadiah, tell the Edomites to quit laughing at Israel's dem uh, the Israelites' demise because theirs is coming too. Like he told Hosea, tell the Israelites, they a hoe, you know? But here God has given Jonah, Jonah the prophet, his prophetic message for some people. Not just any people though. The people of the great city of Nineveh, it said, the great city. Now here's the thing. Great is a, 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 an accurate but unfortunate word to, to translate the Hebrew word here. Because we talk about like, oh, that movie was great. Or, oh, dinner was great. Or, your mom's great. But great here refers mostly to it being massive. So, no, it's not nice to say someone's mom is great in that particular understanding of the word, right? Um, and that's what they're meaning here when they say the great city of Nineveh. Nineveh. They're not talking about like, oh, it's awesome. They're talking about, it's huge. But Nineveh, that great big city, and we'll just see how big it, it is later on, um, has been doing evil, violent, ad idolatrous, and prideful. So they got all the markers of every great capital, uh, empirical capital city. And God's caught wind of this, he says, basically. He sees it all. He sees everything. But basically, he's saying it's gotten to a point where we, we got to deal with this. So he's sending in a messenger. He's sending in a prophet, one of his prophets. Like there's been Obadiah, there's been Isaiah already, there's been Elijah already and Elisha already, but get ready y'all because it's time for a guy named Jonah to shine. So Jonah, God says, go to that big city Nineveh and tell them that I've seen their evil and they're gonna reap what they've sown. Now, if you and I, just imagine if you can that you'd never ever in your entire life heard this story before you'd have a pretty strong guess of what would happen next. Like God tells his prophet, go tell these people this. And you know, Jonah's like, you got it, God, let's do this thing. And he goes and tells them or something, right? Like you just, you would naturally think that's where the story's going. But I want you to take note as we read this here and see if you can pick up what gets repeated three times in the three sentences that make up verse three of Jonah one. Um, and I'm just gonna tell you, it's Tarshish. It's repeated three times in quick succession to really highlight this is not Nineveh where he's going to. So let's look at it. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into that ship to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. Tarshish, maybe he mistook it for Nineveh? I mean, you know, uh, probably not. See, the thing is like, not only do they not sound close to each other, they're geographically not even close to each other. Literally, he is going now in the opposite direction from Nineveh by going to Tarshish. Um, now, if you're familiar with the story, which again, many of us are, so you already knew that, that was gonna happen. I just wonder though, have you ever thought about, like it was kind of struck me this week as I've been studying it. Have you ever thought about the fact that Jonah didn't just stay put? Like he didn't 
just go, no, I'm not gonna do it and stay put and stay doing what he was already doing. He, he actually packed a bag, paid a fare for a ticket and boarded a vessel to get further from the thing that God had called him to do. And twice in these three sentences, it also mentions that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord. He was trying to run from the voice and from the authority of God. But good or bad, that's not really a possibility. As we see in what David wrote in Psalms 139, he says, Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. But if I make my bed in Sheol and hell and the, 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 the land of the dead, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, which is ironic, isn't it? Even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. So David seems to mostly see this as a positive thing, as we see there at the end, even though he did mention fleeing at the beginning. He sees it as a comfort that you can't outrun the presence of God and his sovereign hand. But for Jonah, that day as he punched his ticket to go visit the coast of what is now modern-day Spain, which sounds pretty nice, right? Like go do a holiday on the coast of Spain. Um, he's running from the presence of the Lord, the God of all heaven and earth, who is omnipresent, which is a fancy word that we use to say he's present everywhere at all times. So this is a classic exercise in futility, hence the next three words of verse four, but the Lord. So Jonah's like, ah, I don't wanna do that. I'm gonna run the opposite direction. I'm gonna get a ticket and get on a boat, but the Lord, it says, hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid. These, these sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to try and lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down in the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God uh, will give a thought to us that we may not perish. So the ones that you would expect to be the godless ruffians, the sailors, are crying out to their gods and then asking Jonah, the prophet, to cry out to any god that he serves. The prophet is running from God and the heathen sailors are calling for a prayer meeting. You catch that? It's wild, and it's intentionally meant to be wild for us to, to recognize that, that kind of weird um, discord. And it's hard not to think of the similarities in this story between this story and the one when Jesus, you know, much later is asleep on a boat during a great storm, right? If you're familiar with that story. But it's actually the similarities of these two stories that are supposed to highlight the major difference between the two stories. Because you see, Jesus is asleep, and he could sleep on that boat in the middle of a storm because he was tired, first of all, and he had an unwavering trust in God. And Jonah could sleep in the middle of a storm on that boat because he was tired, but he had closed his ears to God. So that's why he was sleeping that day. But then he gets woken up and we get the infamous part of the story where it says, and they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they're guessing somebody in the boat is the reason for this. And sure enough, they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is it that you've done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? for the sea just kept growing more and more tempestuous. And he said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to get back to dry land because they didn't want to throw this guy overboard, but they could not. For the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O oh Lord, let us not perish for this man's life. And lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked jo up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. They respected and, and trusted and feared the Lord exceedingly, I, I bet. 
And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And Jonah 2 starts by saying, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying... But before we get to it, um, I know a lot just happened, but Jonah the prophet, Jonah the prophet, the sort of anti-prophet, honestly, in this book, as we're starting to see, he's going to pray, and he's going to pray to God. Okay, so this is good. This is good. But as we read his prayer here in a second, you're, I want you to take note of just how much his prayer to God, he talks about himself over and again. Look at it. I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. Yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. I'll look, I'll look at it one day, he says. The, the waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Now, it's not always good, I realize, as a pastor, and for you as well, to judge people on their, their praying and all that. But man, this is some self-centered praying. And I, I've heard this before, you know, people just kind of praying, sort of mentioning God, but it really ends up being about them and their life and all that. We gotta watch out for that. But he hardly talks about the character of God in it. And he mentions nothing, in case you missed it, nothing about the people of Nineveh. Mentions nothing about his regret for not caring for them and not going to them like God had told him to. There's none of that. He's just kind of like, praying some pretty things here and then saying about how vain it is to worship, worship idols. And he, he's going to sacrifice to the Lord when he gets out of this. And he's, he's going to, I tell you what, God, if you get me, it's basically, God, if you get me out of here, I'll tell you what, I'm going to do this. And he says, salvation belongs to the Lord. So I'm not saying all the stuff he said was bad because he said some true stuff. Salvation really does belong to the Lord. But that bold statement of Jonah's is the last thing that we hear from Jonah before God invites him to walk out that belief. God's like, okay, Jonah. So I'm the God of salvation. Then I want to save you from this situation that you're in here in the belly of this great fish. Cool, 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 cool. Uh, Jonah's like, yeah, okay. And the Lord spoke to the fish, it says, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. And then God's like, and I want to send you back on that mission to bring a message to the Ninevites so that I might bring salvation to them too. And Jonah's just like, So then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. He's the God of salvation, right, Jonah? So that's what he's going to do. He's, he's going to save. And it's nearly a repeat of the thing he said before. So God's basically like, basically like okay, let's, let's try this again. So Jonah arose, and he went to Nineveh, which is good. We're getting some progress, according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh, just so you know, was an exceedingly great city, big city. And here we find out how big. Three days journey in breath. Jonah began to go into the city going a day's journey. And he called out, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, many people have looked at this description of what Jonah did and said, people, scholars, things like that, and said that he was one of the most intentionally bad prophets that we see by a, a long stretch in scripture. Like he was, it was, he was so bad at being a prophet in this moment here, especially because, um, it takes three days to go throughout the city and connect with the different neighborhoods and the different pockets of people throughout this big city. It takes three days to do it. And he goes and does one day's journey. And then we, um, we don't know if God had given him a specific script of what to share in telling them about his judgment on them and what they needed to do in order to turn. But yet 40 days and y'all going to be overthrown, doesn't feel like it probably was the, was the whole message God wanted to have. Because there's no mention of God. <laughs> there's no mention of the opportunity to turn to him and be rescued. No mention of any details of what they've done wrong and what they need to do to make it right. 
it, like turn or burn, I don't know if you're familiar, familiar with that phrase, the turn or burn is not really a great way of presenting the gospel message, okay? But this isn't even turn or burn. This is literally just burn, you're gonna burn. That's it. And uh, yet in verse five, the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. From the great, like really greatest, like truly the greatest of them? Verse six says, the word reached the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. He's, more, he's repenting, he's broken. So Jonah seems to almost in all of this want to throw the game. Like he's like tossing the ball, like, oh man. And, and yet by accidentally trying to throw the game, he ends up throwing the winning touchdown. Like, I, I think that this needs to show us something really important that's explained in more detail in other parts of Scripture, but it's really good for our theology to understand this, that God is sovereign to save. His Spirit does the saving work, not our clever arguments or our eloquence or anything like that. It is God who ultimately saves any of us or anybody else. But... So you might think, okay, well, then he didn't need to use Jonah or me or it doesn't matter if we try to be good or try to find the right way. No, no, here's the thing. But he still obviously, as we're seeing with his story, really cares about having us obediently involved in going and speaking and contending for people's salvation. So the people repent. And then actually it goes on and says in verse 7 about the king, he issued a proclamation and published it through Nineveh, saying, By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, uh, herd nor flock, taste anything. Everyone's going to be fasting. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is, that is in his hands. Who knows, he says, God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we might not perish. What genuine and heartfelt repentance we get to see here. They're throwing themselves at the mercy of God. Despite all of uh, Nineveh, and they're the capital of Assyria at that time, so despite all of their power and prestige, the Holy Spirit has opened their eyes to see their desperate need to follow Jesus. Well, to follow God. Um, but anyway, when God saw what they did, it says, how they turned from their evil way. God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. God wasn't, just so you're clear, God wasn't hell-bent, and I'm using that word a little bit tongue-in-cheek, on inflicting pain and disaster on these people. Yes, that was the message. Like, hey, I'm gonna, you're gonna pay, you're gonna, but he, he was, he was showing them that what they had sown, they were going to reap if they didn't turn and repent. But God's greatest desire in all of this, even in calling them to repent, was to repair and restore them. His mercy came through a call of, you will not do this anymore. You're going to pay for it. It was his mercy because then they realized, oh, oh, this means business. I want to stop. And I'll just tell you, that's God's desire for you too and for all people is to repair and to restore, even if he needs to call us in a really harsh way to repentance. That is the character of our God, that he is capable of loving the greatest and the least. The ones that maybe who've only sinned in small ways and the ones who are like black belt sinners. He's not only capable of loving and of saving and of restoring those people, he in fact longs to do that. In fact, he'll send a prophet who spends three days in a dark chamber of a fish to bring that message of hope which was, by the way, just a foreshadowing of a greater prophet, priest, and king, Jesus the Messiah, who would spend three days in a dark chamber of a tomb to then arise with a message of eternal hope. So Jonah shares the message. The people repent. The Lord takes note and chooses to relent of his aforementioned destruction. So mission impossible just became mission complete. Like, oh my gosh, Jonah, you did it. You, you threw the winning touchdown. You didn't, didn't even try. And yet, wow, look at this. Like, this is amazing. And, um, and then we go to the fourth and final chapter. And it starts off by saying, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was angry. Boy, Jonah, you really are something. Like, right? It keeps on going. And he prayed to the Lord. We're going to get another Jonah prayer. This should be fun. And it said, and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? 
That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And now, before we get to the rest of it, now we finally find out what was unknown to us earlier in the story. You know, why was Jonah told to go to Nineveh, but instead fled to Tarshish? Why didn't he want to go? What, what was the reason? We never knew until now. But he, it was because apparently he knew that God was gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, willing to relent from disaster. And apparently, Jonah didn't want that for Nineveh. And there's been some speculation um, from some really educated people who study this um, deeply and all that. And they think that Jonah probably was deeply hurt and angered personally by what the Ninevites had done to either him or to other people groups, um, or his people groups, you know, his, his country. And there's been some also some speculation that it also maybe could have been some ethnocentrism, um, some, uh, some basically nationalistic pride that he was like, I, I believe God should only be God for the Israelites and not for those evil people over there who aren't Israelites like us. This was something, by the way, that was still being reckoned with by people who followed the same God, Yahweh. Hundreds of years later, Paul had to write to the Romans and say, or, or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. The Jew who's gone through that procedure to show that they're Jewish and the Gentile, the non-Jewish person who hasn't gone through that outward demonstration to show that they're a Jew because it doesn't matter that. He's looking for people who want to follow him. And uh, without knowing exactly why it was that Jonah didn't want to see God's grace and mercy and compassionate work in the Ninevites, we just know he didn't. So much so that when he was given um, the chance, he asked God to just kill him right then and there. Just, it's better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Like, I just, oh, I wish I could know the tone. I, I kind of imagine it that way, like, do you do well to be angry? And Jonah went out of the city, doesn't answer it, and sat to the east of the city. It would be up on a hill overlooking the city because he wanted to see and see what would happen. So he was running up that road, running up that hill, which I guess we could have called this message that song too. But anyway, and he made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city because he's kind of still hoping that maybe a few like lightning bolts, a little bit of fire and brimstone might still come. And now the Lord God in this moment appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun arose, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die again and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? Like it was crazy for me, just to pause real quickly before we go on and finish it. It was crazy for me to notice that in the book of Jonah, God actually operates in the role of a prophet to Jonah the prophet. In the story of Jonah, God's the prophet. Jonah the prophet is actually the heathen audience that needs correcting in the whole book. And God, in true prophetic form, as I've told you before uh, in this series, there's a lot of illustrations, a lot of metaphors, a lot of pictures. God ends up using different illustrations, like a storm, and like a great fish, and like a plant, to serve as object lessons to the fact that God can't be ran away from, that God is mighty to save, and will save you even when you're thrown into the middle of an ocean, that we can be more concerned, unfortunately, sometimes about our comfort than God's kingdom. So God is prophetically speaking to this guy who's supposed to be his prophet and going, do you do well to be angry for this plant? And Jonah responds, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, and that's the last words, by the way, we hear from him, from Jonah. The Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle. And that's it. The book ends like that. Blank screen, pause, roll credits. The question that God asks, 
hangs in the air without us knowing how Jonah would reply or would have replied or did reply. Kind of reminds me of how Inception ends with the question of whether the spinning top is truly starting to wobble like some of you think it is or is going to fall uh, and is going to fall or if it's just, you know, like going to go on this endless spin cycle. Um, but as this story of Jonah has been told and retold and as it's been studied to understand at even deeper levels and appreciated more and more and more for studying it and really getting into it, one of the things that um, those investigators, those scholars have surmised that this question hangs unanswered because in its being unanswered, the question suddenly then lands on us. It's like we're waiting for the answer. Like oh, I was going to say, we grab some popcorn and then put it in our mouth and we look over to Jonah and Jonah's looking at us. And, and then we look at God and, and God's looking at us too. Oh, oh, oh wait. Suddenly it's kind of like the, the twist in the movie The Fight Club or the twist in the movie the, uh, the Usual Suspects or The Sixth Sense where once you discover the plot twist, you, like, you need to go back and watch it all over again now with that new lens. Like, wait, Edward Norton is Tyler Durden. Verbal is Kaiser Soze. Bruce Willis is dead the whole time. And you are Jonah. I am Jonah. Or at least we could be if we're not careful. Whoa! Like, okay, so that's what this is going, that's what's going on here. So the question ends up at the end turning on us. And now we realize that this story is absolutely about Jonah and a mission to go to Nineveh. But it's also absolutely about you and what God has called you to do, the life he's clearly called you to, and the question of your obedience, and the question of your values in life. And once we know that, we, we, like I said, we just have to go back and see it all over again through that new lens. So, let's do that. Jonah hears a message from God and chooses to do what he wants to do instead of what God wants him to do. So let me ask you, are there messages that you've heard from God that you're choosing to willingly run against? Whatever that means, things that you know God has said that you're choosing to just run in the opposite direction. Jonah serves as a prophetic message to you then. Jonah then also finds himself in a terribly rough spot. He's in the belly of an, a great fish in the middle of the ocean and he cries out to God for help. But it's mostly just because life's really tough and there's really nowhere else to turn. So once God answers his prayer and life gets a little bit better, he's pretty much right back to wanting to have his way and he's really upset and doesn't want to do what God wants him to do. And is, Let me ask you, is this anything like how you can be with God sometimes, if you're being honest? Do you have a pattern of crying out and changing direction just to get yourself out of the rough spot that you're in? But then once you're out, you kind of go back to life your way. You end up just kind of wanting to do things your way again. Well, then Jonah serves as a prophetic message to you in that. And then Jonah ends up consenting to do what God asked him to do, and he shares the message to Nineveh, but he gives it some of the most meteor, mediocre <laughs> uh, effort that you possibly could. In following God's command in your life, are you passionate and giving it your all, or are you just kind of like phoning it in? Are you loving and giving and serving and praying and pursuing and sharing and obeying with dedication or with hesitation? See, Jonah, if so, Jonah serves as a prophetic message to you. And then the Ninevites repent and Jonah whines and whimpers. So let me ask you right away, are there people that you would maybe rather see receive God's judgment than God's mercy? Are there people that you simply don't hope and pray that God does save? If so, Jonah serves as a prophetic message to you. God clearly cared for that great city so much that he sent one of his people to tell them about him. And God is still sending his people all over the world to go to great cities and great regions all over the world, to go to great cities in the Middle East, to go to great cities in Asia, to go, go to great cities and regions in the Pacific Islands and in Russia and all these other places around the world where the gospel needs to be pushed forth and known. Even in D.C., where we have partners in D.C., um, who help reach people that are coming from other nations to our nation. Um, and let me ask you, do you share God's heart for the people of the cities, of the nations? Because cities shouldn't be a place that the church runs from, which it historically, unfortunately, has. But cities should be a place that the church runs to. 
Let me ask you, do you have a compassion for those places and those people? Are you, are you looking through, are you looking at them with a gospel lens of praying for and believing for and hoping for? Um, because God is still calling people. And maybe God's even calling you to foreign cities and regions to tell them about him. And I hope if he is, you're listening to notice what happens in Jonah's story to, to serve as a prophetic message to you. And I just want to also invite you at that moment, at this moment right here, no matter where God has called you when it comes to his global mission, that we're all meant to be a part of it. And this fall, we get the opportunity to once again have perspectives uh, as a 15-week course offered in our region where many churches are going to come together to put it on. But it's a great course for you to discover what God's mission is for the world and how you are called to be a part of it and what it looks like for us to strategically be involved in what God's doing to spread the gospel to the great cities and the great regions of our world today because we want to learn from the prophetic message of Jonah. And then lastly, Jonah finds himself caring more for the comfort that the plant had given him than the people that God had called him to. So let me ask you, what are your vines? What are your plants? The things that you might actually care more about, if you're being really honest, scary honest, than the salvation of others. The comforts that you would pray about sooner than you'd pray about someone's salvation or the, their spiritual health. You know, we can find ourselves crying out to God to get with the program. Come on, God, get with the program and give us what we need. And God's maybe crying out something to us too. Which is why I wanted to share the last lines of this poem called You Jonah by Thomas Carlyle, where he says, And Jonah stalked to his shaded seat and waited for God to come around to his way of thinking. And God is still waiting for a host of Jonahs to come around to his way of loving. See, Jonah shows us that even in the Old Testament, God was interested not just in the salvation of his chosen people, but in using his chosen people to be a vessel for bringing salvation to all people. And Jonah's story serves as a warning to us of people who desire the benefits and the blessings of knowing God, but then refuse the responsibility that comes with knowing him. Because see, it really gets summed up in this. Salvation is from the Lord. You were right, Jonah. Salvation is from the Lord. And so everything about it is on his terms then. Both what he requires and calls us to do when we are gifted the salvation, the gift of salvation, and that we be a part of what he wants to do in bringing it to others. So if we're born to run, may we be born again so that we don't run like Jonah did, but we run towards the things that God has called us to do as we are called to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May we also be prepared to run in that direction as well.